Good afternoon. My name is Gabriela Sotolaviaga. I am the Antonio Madero Professor for the Study of Mexico in the History of Science Department here at Harvard. And together with my co-host, Diane Davis from the Graduate School of Design, we, uh, we co-host the Mexico program at Dr. Klaas. Um, it is a real honor for me to be introducing today's speaker. Maria Josefina Saldaña Ortillo is a professor in the Social and Cultural Analysis Department and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at New York University. Her book, Indian Given, Racial Geographies Across Mexico and the United States, received the 2019 Casa de las Americas Literary Prize in Latino Studies, the 2017 ASA John Hope Franklin Book Prize, and the 2017 NACCS Book Award. Her research focuses on revolution, subaltern politics, indigenous people, racial formation, migration, narco economies, and Latin American and Latinx cultural studies. She is chairwoman of the Coalición Mexicana, an immigrants' rights organization, and an expert witness for Central American asylum cases with legal aid agencies internationally. On a personal note, I want to say that in our careers as academics, we, we hope to find interlocutors whom we can think through broadly and widely. And for me, um, Professor Saldana Portillo is one of these important interlocutors. It is a real honor for us to have her here today. And I, um, we have just an hour, so I will turn it to her and please. I think you're muted. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I wanna begin by thanking you, Professor Gabriela Soto Laviaga for inviting me to your speaker series, Draculas for hosting me, Maria, Ma Mauricio Benitez for organizing the event and Romy uh, Malagamba for translating into the Spanish. Because we have so little time, I'm gonna jump right in. 20 years ago, I published Who is the Indian in Atslan? Rewriting Mestizaje, Indi Indianism, and Chicanismo from the Lacandon, an essay in that initiated a critique of Mestizaje for the ways in which it placed indigenous people and indigeneity under erasure within Chicanx aesthetics and scholarship. I revisit my critique today, not as an empty gesture of commemoration, but because the last 20 years of scholarship and migration patterns makes revisiting mestizaje necessary. Since the publication of Who's the Indian in Atslan in 2021, in 2001, we have seen the rise to prominence of the white settler colonial paradigm within US Native American and Indigenous Studies and American Studies more broadly. This has coincided with the largest influx of indigenous immigrants from Mexico since the 1920s and 30s. Researching my second book, Indian Given, during this period also made me aware of the history of legislation requiring Mexicans <clears throat> who were annexed after 1848 and subsequent Mexican immigrants to give up all ties to their indigenous and African heritage in order to become US citizens. When I wrote Who's the Indian in Atslan, I was conducting fieldwork for my first book, The Revolutionary Imagination in the Americas, among Zapatistas in Chiapas, while researching the impact of the Mexican Revolution on the indigenous peasantry. While their political with their political and economic demands, the Zapatistas challenged the mestizaje indigenismo dyad at the heart of revolutionary biopolitics. Consequently, my critique of mestizaje was laser focused on its political function as a tool for managing an ethnically and racially diverse population after the 1910 Mexican Revolution. Mestizaje as a model of revolutionary citizenship gave all Mexicans claim to indigenous ancestry and belonging in the nation, regardless of their class, ethnicity, or race, while relegating indigenous peoples into a subordinate coordinate role within Mexico's developmentalist agenda, one that included land reform, universal education, and healthcare, benefiting indigenous peoples considerably, but also that established the National Indigenous Institute geared towards the rehabilitation of indigenous pueblos and their cultures. Thus, mestizaje operated as a biopolitical tool for managing the life of Mexico's indigenous population within the nation. 
It's from this vantage point that I first recognized that Mestizaje had played a similar though not identical role within the Chicano movement, its aesthetics and academic production. Mestizaje united Mexican Americans, diverse in class, race, ethnicity, sexuality, and gender identification for Chicano nationalism by universalizing ancestral claims to the US Southwest, Atzlan, through a shared, if tenuous, <clears throat> indigenous past. Mestizaje provided the rationale for Chicanismo's claim to symbolic sovereignty over Atzlan, and thus enabled a form of indigenous appropriation that necessarily placed living indigenous peoples and sovereignty under erasure. This erasure sustained myths of indigenous belonging for Chicano artists, activists, and scholars for whom political sovereignty is foreclosed within the United States. The indigenismo accessed by mestizaje by canonical authors like Gloria Anzaldúa and Richard Rodriguez, whose test I text I analyzed in my 2001 essay, ultimately did not escape the logic of indigenous erasure. However much Anzaldúa and Rodríguez revised the aesthetic tropes of the dyad, Atzlan nationalism and indigenous appropriation impinged on the sovereignty of real living indigenous peoples. The essay inspired a paradigmatic shift in the approach to mestizaje within Chicanex aesthetics and scholarship that, among other things, helped foment a fertile interface between Native American and Indigenous studies and Latinx and Chicanex studies by providing vital recognition for Native American scholars of the Indigenous appropriation at the heart of Chicano mestizaje. Two things strike me upon rereading my essay, as 20 years of hindsight adds new dimensions to my critique, as well as necessarily shows me its limitations. Firstly, I fail to appreciate the psychic pain of racism and loss registered in Anzaldúa and Rodríguez's memoirs, and accordingly the role mestizaje played in psychic reparations. I stand by the essay's argument that Anzaldúa's mestiza consciousness was a form of romanticized appropriation of indigeneity. However, teaching Anzaldúa all these years has taught me how powerfully her writing speaks to bi and multiracial students through the trope of mestizaje, and not just just to Chicanex students, as Emilia Sawada argues in her forthcoming Ghost Mothers of the Biracial Haunted Publics of the Pacific Southwest, it enabled biracial queer subjects of Asian American descent as well to recognize themselves in Mestizaje's mutant anti-colonial possibilities. Secondly, I am convinced by my use of the term erasure rather than elimination to describe how mestizaje constrains indigenous life as a form of biopower. Putting indigeneity under erasure is philosophically a crossing out but leaving in place. Mestizaje does not eliminate indigeneity or indigenous peoples, rather it subordinates indigenous peoples while nevertheless preserving them because of the vital work they do for the nation. In a Derridian sense, erasure underscores the mutually constituting aspects of mestizaje and indigeneity, each term re uh, relying on the other's difference for meaning. The term elimination, so prominent within white settler, the white settler colonial paradigm today, was not available to me in 2001. Though Patrick Wolf published his treatise on white settler colonialism in 1999, it took more than a decade for his paradigm to disseminate broadly. In White Man's Flower in 1999, Wolf argued that the degree of miscegenation in Anglophone colonial societies was so numerically overwhelming to white settlers that they absorbed mixed people into their settler ranks, effectively eliminating indigenous peoples in the process. Despite Wolf explicitly stating that miscegenation operated differently in Latin America, Subsequent settler colonial scholars insist that mestizaje is nothing more than a form of native elimination, often citing my essay in support of this argument. I continue to hold that mestizaje is a method of managing cont the continuation of indigenous life in Latin America, not its elimination. This is more than an academic quibble, as pedagogically, culturally, aesthetically, and existentially, mestizaje continues to generate meaning in excess of its biopower, as does indigenismo to the, uh, the other term in the dyad. 
Mestizaje signifies indigenous erasure, but also makes available forms of recognition and redress in indigenismo. As Zapotec literary scholar Lourdes Alberto has argued, uh, there is a mestizaje desde abajo employed by indigenous subjects as a mechanism for recognition. I revisit the term mestizaje in this talk to see if it can indeed be resignified for the purposes of indigenous recognition within the vexed US politics of race. Mestizaje names the political economy of indigenous extraction and appropriation. In addition to ad appropriating ind indigenous cultures, for political nationalisms, mestizaje structures the labor market across the American hemisphere in ways that directly benefit the US by cheapening the extraction of labor value from indigenous populations and by limiting indigenous peoples to subordinated segments of the labor market for racial capital. The lack of Spanish language fluency, for example, is a barrier to knowledge about labor rights, not only in Mexico, but in the United States as well. Entire communities of indigenous men and women have been recruited by labor contractors from their ejidos in Tlaxcala, Puebla, and Oaxaca to come and work as crop hands all over the country, including the Northeast. Half of the nation's crop hands are undocumented according to the US Department of Agriculture's own statistics. There is nothing novel in pointing out that our agriculture production depends on a hyper exploited undocumented labor force for cheap foodstuffs we enjoy, even as the pandemic allows us to recognize this population as essential for racial capitalism. It is novel, however, that the percentage of indigenous undocumented migrants has greatly increased as indigenous farmers were pushed off their communal lands in, by 1990 neoliberal reforms and by contemporary climate change. Indigenous people also find work in urban restaurants and grocery stores as part of the low wage service sector that makes up the racial geography of our cities. Felipe Lopez and David Rustin's research among Oaxacan, Mixtec, and Zapotec migrant workers highlights the role mestizaje plays in segmenting the labor force, especially when we recognize mestizaje as not only miscegenation, but as coerced acculturation to mestizo norms. They found the lack of Spanish literacy was the determining factor in channeling Mixtec migrants into the hyper exploitative agricultural sector in Mexico and California, while Zapotec migrants, who were both Spanish literate and had work in Oaxaca's travel industry, tourist industry, found work in the less exploitative urban service sectors. Even within these sectors, however, Lopez and Runston found discriminatory treatment and pay differentials between indigenous and mestizo workers on ranches and farms in Mexico and California. Meanwhile, Zapotecs who landed jobs in California restaurant kitchens found that speaking Zapotec created tensions between themselves and non-Indigenous workers, causing Zapotecs to deny their ethnicity due to fear of discrimination from fellow Mexicans. Language barriers and ethnic shaming combined with undocumented status to create a hyper-exploitable Indigenous class for racial capital. The militarization of the border, meanwhile, ended interval migration, making indigenous Latin Americans a permanent part of Latinx and Native American populations in the United States. Whereas before, the ease of crossing the border allowed undocumented immigrants to return to their families after work cycles, the militarization of the border encouraged immigrants to bring their families with them or raise new families here, staying indefinitely. Consequently, the native population in the United States grew by 21% in the 1990s. In California, the percentage of indigenous people in that decade grew by a whopping 146%. In the 2000 census, the number of Latinx who chose American Indian or Alaska Native as their only uh, ethnic or racial identification was just over 400,000. In 2010, that number increased to just over 685,000. While this represents less than a 1% of the 1% of the over 50 million people who identify as Latinx, it nevertheless represents a greater than 50% increase in Latinx 
peoples identifying as indigenous over the course of just 10 years. While the number for the 2020 censuses are still being analyzed, the statistics for the 2020 census are still being analyzed, there was an 86.5% increase in the number of indigenous peoples living in the United States today over the last decade from 5.2 million in 2010 to 9.7 million in 2020. We still need to determine how much of that increase comes from Latin American indigenous immigrants, but I would say that it's going to comprise the lion's share of the increase. The US census allows a person to fill in the name of one's enro enrolled or principal tribe, but the word tribe isn't used in Latin America, Thus, many who identified as Native American left that blank. Nevertheless, those who did list a tribal affiliation put down Mayan, Mixtec, Zapotec, Triqui, Purepuche, thus indicating that they are primarily from Guatemala and Mexico. It is here that we locate what escapes mestizaje's extractive logic. As a discourse for producing national unity and managing indigenous life, mestizaje necessarily provides the contradictory terms for indigenous inclusion. An Indian as origin story, the Indian as origin story of mestizaje provided pan-American indigenous movements and peoples with the discursive possibility of claiming their pre-colonial belonging within the nation even if this required a certain folklorization of their cultures. It's precisely this discursive possibility that Zapatista seized upon in 1994 when they reclaimed Mexico for themselves with their slogan, Todos Somos Indios, we are all Indian. If dead Indians were the folkloric origin of the nation, then living indigenous peoples have continuously decolonized this discursive ground by insisting on authoring their own and their nation's destiny. By claiming American Indian status on the US census, a status not intended for them, these new indigenous immigrants stretch the meaning of the term Indian, imbuing it with unintended content mediated by mestizaje, by choosing American Indian, they unmoor their indigenous attachments to folkloric Mexico, Guatemala, or Peru, but also unmoor American Indian from its original bureaucratic intent. They have no tribal recognition or affiliation from the US perspective, but they reiterate their indigenous priority, this time attaching it to the United States. By insisting on their indigenous identity in the United States, they are claiming, I would argue, a prior continental belonging, a trans-colonial belonging, if you will, that traverses the time and space of competing colonialities across the American landscape. This trans-colonial indigenous priority as foundational form is mediated by mestizaje. I want to give one extended example, and now I shall start my screen share. From May to November every year, Zapotec and Mixtec communities in Santa Cruz, San Jose, Los Angeles, and San Diego host Gay La Guetza celebrations. In Los Angeles, Gay La Guetza events last the entire month, complete with a basketball tournament, a Miss Oaxaca beauty pageant, and an indigenous film and literature festival. These California Gay Laguetzas reiterate the yearly Gay Laguetza celebrations in Oaxaca, an international tourist attraction responsible for a sizable chunk of Oaxaca's annual GDP. The principal event at Oaxaca's Gay Laguetza is a seemingly endless day of dance performances representing the 16 different indigenous peoples of Oaxaca. Each dance troupe performs the traditional dances from their region in their traditional tra trajes, as you see uh, illustrated here. These women are wearing seven of the 16 patterns. At the end of each dance, the dancers customarily um, gift their particular product of their indigenous region 
that their indigenous region is famous for pineapples, chocolate, peanuts, gourds, and they fling these gifts into the audience. So you better duck or catch. The Oaxacan Gay La Guetza is a textbook product of indigenous policies instituted by revolutionary mestizaje. Andres Henestrosa Morales, a Zapotec cultural critic and public intellectual, was himself the product of revolutionary indigenismo. Henestrosa explains in one of his many treatises on Zapotec culture that Gay La Guetza is, quote, an erroneous transcription of the Zapotec word Gwendalisa, meaning kinship and proximity, end quote. The suffix sa in Zapotec means essence. Henestrosa continues, thus Gwendalisa means that kinship and relationality are the essence of Zapotec being. As a ritual of dance and feasting, Gwendalisa symbolizes belonging to community, but more specifically, the aid that each Zapotec offers other Zapotecs freely at moments of great importance, like childbirth, death, and marriage. Gift giving during the Gwendalisa is a representation of aid given without the expectation of reciprocity. The, this mistranscription the slippage from the Zapotec Guendalisa to the Spanish Gay La Guetza, a slippage inherent in all translation, allows us to trace not simply the Zapotec history of colonization and survivance. It offer, also offers a profound example of Zapotec transcolonial priority. Let me explain. The Aztecs first formalized the Guendalisa in honor of Sente O'u, the Aztec goddess of corn. Fixing the date of what were multiple festivals by the Zapotec to one day in July. The Zapotec strategically celebrated the Guendalisa atop Sierra de Fortin, where they had placed their garrison to maintain imperial control over the Oaxacan Valley with its Zapotec and Mixtec inhabitants. Today, the Guelaguetza is still held atop uh, Fortin Hill in July. Imperial Aztecs, in other words, grafted their celebration of Sente Otl over Zapotec and Ixtec celebrations to multiple gods, including Cosijo, the god of rain, and Pitao Cocobi, the god of grain fields. When Spaniards displaced the Aztecs as imperial overlords, they transformed the celebration of Sente Otl into the celebration of the Virgen del Carmen. It is the Aztec calendar of Zapotec and Mixtec celebration then that circuitously set the date for Carmen's official Saints Day in the Catholic calendar as July 16th, the old Spanish switcheroo atop Aztec switcheroos. During the, the liberal 19th century, when Mexican elites uh, reduced indigenous lands to less than 1% of the national territory, the Guendalisa again reverted to the Zapotec and Mixtec communities, according to Henestrosa. It isn't until 1932 that the Gay La Guetza was revived by the revolutionary state. It's then that the 16 regional traditional dances were added to the official festivities. Moreover, it's at this point that Gwen Gay La Guetza gift giving was explicitly linked to regional productivity in keeping with the revolutionary state's developmentalist agenda. 1974 uh, was when the state built, uh, I'm sorry, in 1968, a beauty pageant for the title of Sente O'u Goddess is added to the festivities in Oaxaca. And in 1974, the Oaxacan government built an auditorium capable of seating tens of thousands of domestic and foreign tourists on Fortin Hill. When Zapotec and Mixtec communities host Gay La Guetza celebrations in California, New Jersey, or New York, they are reiterating Gwendalisa as Zapotec and Mixtec kinship community aid and obligation. The reiteration of Gwendalisa is especially necessary in the United States as it makes sheer survival possible. The, the Gay La Guetza, however, is a reiteration of the revolutionary mestizaje indigenismo dyad in the US. It is the public performance of a particular kind of indigenous folklore tradition in the interest of establishing indigenous continental priority, which in turn invo is invoked to create inclusion within US nationalism, yet another iteration of colonial geography. I am not suggesting that the Gwendalisa would not exist if not for revolutionary mestizaje. 
But the meaning of Gay Lagetza exists in the aftermath of revolutionary mestizaje, which enables the claiming of a transcolonial indigenous priority. Gwenda Lisa establishes, uh, Gwenda Lisa, Lisa, where am I? Yeah, Gwenda Lisa establishes communal ties and, uh, com and commitments. Um, the public Gay Lagetza celebrations claim California, New York, and New Jersey possibly coming soon to a theater in Massachusetts for Zapotec and indigenous indigenous peoples. These celebrations are an example of mestizaje desde abajo. Actually, I'm gonna stop the share because it's gonna be a while before I come back. There we go. Um, uh, where was I? Oh yes, um, these celebrations are an example of mestizaje desde abajo, of challenging and stretching the terms of revolutionary mestizaje from the position of indigenous priority. The Oaxacan Gay Lagetza showcases indigenous peoples performing their symbolic origins for, of the nation through the folkloric dances and their, their elaborate handwoven embroidered trajes. However, it also showcases the literal fruits of indigenous labor, their agricultural production of the traditional national diet. Piña, elote, chocolate, cacahuates, chayote, camote, tomate, aguacate. What do all these foodstuffs have in common? The ote and ate suffixes point us towards an answer as they indicate Nahuatl words that transformed the Spanish language through linguistic mestizaje. They are foodstuffs developed by indigenous agricultural technology in the Mesoamerican cradle of civilization, the foodstuffs of every Mexican's daily diet and ours as well, including vanilla, by the way. Mestizaje's extractive and appropriate logic thus reveals how the shared culture that we call mestizo in Latin America today is profoundly indigenous. As Simon Trujillo and I argue elsewhere, mestizaje misnames a shared culture as mestizo when it is in fact largely based on indigenous knowledge production, foodways, cosmologies, medicines, ethics, modes of speech and address, modes of agricultural project production, the engineering of biodiversity, because biodiversity is a feat of indigenous engineering. The very vocabularies we use today vary widely depending on the specific indigenous languages spoken and indigenous technologies developed in the indigenous geographies claimed by nation states today. What one calls a tamal, never mind what is in it, or an aguacate, depends entirely on whether Quechua, Aymara, or Mapuche hybridized Spanish in the Andes, or Nahuatl and Maya hybridized Spanish in Mesoamerica. So much of what we call mestizo in the Americas is thoroughly indigenous. Such a material and epistemic debt requires us to re-examine the nature and politics of indigenous elimination under models of white settler colonialism. Mestizaje challenges the Anglophone settler colonial model of destruction and replacement because in Latin America, mestizaje enabled the inclusion and miming of indigenous knowledge, even as indigenous peoples themselves were devalued. Mestizaje sets a specific alternative, sets specific alternatives to settler dominance that, however paradoxically, created a space for the epistemic vitality of indigenous peoples who transgress the enclosures of mestizo hybridity. If mestizaje put indigenous knowledge production under erasure in the service of mestizo knowledge, but not mestizo nationalism. Then decolonizing mestizaje entails first and foremost a distinct politics of knowledge, especially Latinx knowledge production. It requires new methodologies that would allow scholars to reevaluate the archives, texts, monuments, institutions, and memories of colonial modernity for indigenous content. I return to methodology at the end of my talk. For now, I suggest that this is not so much a romantic project of indigenous retrieval as it is an epistemic attribution of intellectual property rights. Decolonizing mestizaje, I argue elsewhere, entails recognizing that modernity is not the exclusive product of mestizo or white supremacy. Benedict, Arnick, Ar Benedict Anderson <laughs> convincingly argued that the na nation state form originated in the Americas, in which case the abstractions of democracy and equality are necessarily a product of European encounter with indigenous cultures and governmentalities, as well as with indigenous freedom movements that precipitated independence from Spain, as Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui has argued. 
Similarly, as Nicole Edson Delgado shows us in her forthcoming man monograph, Yaki activists and intellectuals provided models of participatory democracy and communalism for the Mexican Revolution of 1910. Um, once we relinquish the concept of mestizaje as an enactment of a liberatory racial hybridity, we must then forge the difficult work of integrating mestizaje for its indigenous content as a problem of knowledge production under the duress of what Trujillo has called colonial epistemicide. Decolonizing indigenous knowledge production, mestizaje desde abajo, must be a priority in 21st century Latinx studies. It falls to, falls to us because we are the gatekeepers of what gets defined as Latinx knowledge and because we stand in a unique relationship to indigenous ancestry. Mestizaje named and continues to name what is missing for Chicanx and other biracial Latinx subjects subjected to US racial jurisprudence, a jurisprudence that privileges hypodescent. More than 100 years of US law and court decisions required Mexicans to emphatically renounce any and all indigenous and African heritage. This, the forms of limited enfranchisement available for Mexicans legally required this disassociation, regardless of kinship ties. What's more, indigenous pueblos recognized as such by the US were similarly required to sever kinship ties with their mestizo family members in order to be properly Indian and to maintain their lands and reservation status. The gravity of this historical loss of indigeneity, its psychic toll cannot simply be discounted and dismissed. The influx of indigenous migrants over the last 30 years, however, alerts me to another consequence of the US racial order of hypodescent that I did not consider when I wrote, who is the Indian in Aztlan? A significant percentage of the millions of Mexican immigrants to the United States over the last century were indigenous, not mestizo of over the 20th century. Most of these indigenous Mexican immigrants inevitably gave up their indigenous attachments to become just plain Mexican under the cultural and legal duress of US, US hypodescent rules and racial citizenship. When I critiqued mestizaje for the romanticized access it gave Chicanos to a long lost indigenous ancestry, I didn't recognize that for many, indigenous ancestry was no more than one generation removed. It was specific and geographically rooted. It was repressed or foreclosed. It is uncanny, unmourned, and ungrieved. The loss of indigeneity then is not an event, it is a structure of an ongoing, an ongoing structure well beyond the Chicanex psyche, as Trujillo and I argued in the fall issue of Atzlan, fall 2021 issue of Atzlan. It isn't consigned to the past. Indigenous migrants to the United States from Mexico, Central America, the Andes, are continuously coerced into losing connections to land and kin because nothing in US legal codes or racial formations allows them to claim indigenous identity here, although they do anyway. Uh, these indigenous people do not conform to the narrow rules of US Native American rep recognition. As a consequence, no, in, yeah, as a consequence, will the 3.0 generation of Zapotec or Mixtec immigrants to the United States cease to be indigenous and fall into the generic category of mestizo through lack of recognition in US terms? Will this be yet another iteration of the appropriative story of cultural mestizaje? Or can we decolonize mestizaje as an avenue for naming different modalities of indigenous specificity? As a possible answer to, to these questions, I close with another example of mestizaje desde abajo. <clears throat> yes. In 2018, uh, the Los Angeles Public Library hosted an exhibit titled Visualizing Language, Oaxaca in LA, as part of the specific standard time sprawling Los Angeles Latin America exhibit. The muralist are the Tlacolu Locos, a Zapotec collective from <clears throat> from Tlacolula, Oaxaca, 
where Zapotecs make up 50% of the population, almost all of whom have relatives in Los Angeles. The murals commemorate kinship and proximity between Zapotecs in Tlacolula and Los Angeles. Oh, wait, here I'm supposed to go back to check this out. Yes, here we go. They sit beneath, as you can see up here, they sat below um, the D Dean Cronwell's permanent 1933 murals, the four great eras of California, celebrating Anglo settlers' conquest of California. As cultural critic Kat Ramirez summarizes, these murals, quote, dispel the myth that indigenous people are tethered to the past and to a single place, bringing into focus Oaxaca, California, end quote. In Mestizaje desde abajo, visual is the Desde abajo of visual, in a mestizaje of this, mestizaje desde abajo of visual aesthetics, these murals marry the traditional Zapotec trajes of, um, let me go forward, yes, the traditional Zapotec trajes, embroidery, jewelry, and architectural grecas that we see tattoos on, on this girl's face. Um, with Chicanex style, graffiti fonts, tattoos, and the gang sign, as you can see here, for LA's West Side, a, a Oaxaca neighborhood. Ramirez argues the murals challenge Cornwall's representation of a California fantasy of Spanish colonialism as a bunch of docile Indians, selfless priests, and beautiful senoritas who graciously accepted the triumph of Anglo-Protestant industry. This is made evident by the image of the conquistador's helmet uh, that we see here shot through with indigenous arrows, one of which affixes the image of Toy Purina, the Tonga medicine woman who led a revolt against the San Gabriel mission. The image Remedia suggests is the recognition of, quote, Kuleana, the responsibility, authority, and, the, and right indigenous immigrants have to other peoples and the occupied lands they live and work on, end quote. Ramirez does not elaborate. However, I took her to mean that the inclusion of Toipurina's portrait by the Latacolu Locos was a visual land acknowledgement, a way of asking the Tongva for permission to be in Los Angeles. Instead, Ramirez immediately does an 180 degree turn, suggesting instead that, um, suggesting instead that the incorporation of this portrait is another form of indigenismo, a celebration of, quote, past and distant Indians, rather than recognizing with present and proximate indigenous peoples. Once again, I came face to face in print with the afterlife of my critique, almost word for word, refracted through the white settler colonial paradigm, my critique from 2001. 20 years later, it's not mestizaje that is displacing living Indians, but the critique of mestizaje and indigenismo that is being put to use to eliminate indigenous who are proximate and living Indians, Zapotec Los Angelinos, by rendering them as always already geographically alien. Ramirez concludes that the Tlacolu Locos and the LA Zapotecs who invited them were perpetuating, quote, settler, contemporary settler logics, end quote, because they were ultimately assimilating Zapotecs into the US multiculturalism as just another group of immigrants um, at the expense of the Tongva. The fact that the murals were commissioned by the Los Angeles Public Library in conjunction with the Getty Science Foundation solidifies this for Ramirez as, quote, Commission, the commission folded indigenous Oaxacans into Los Angeles heterogeneous populations and transformed them from our advance, peoples forced into a settler society through the violence of European and Anglo-American global expansion into immigrants, Im newcomers whose contributions to a society are recognized and valued. In short, Oaxaca Californias were, uh, were assimilated, end quote. To be fair, Ramirez argues that the commission does this, Californios, but Zapotecs are nevertheless complicit, as she concludes by agreeing with Lourdes Gutierrez Najera and Corinta Maldonado's assessment, assessment that, quote, indigenous Mexicans are not exempt from perpetuating contemporary settler logics, end quote. Why are we compelling Zapotec and Mixtec Angelinos into the white settler colonial paradigm when doing so reifies national boundaries set by imperialist countries and confirms, conforms to their racial geographies? Instead, I suggest that we read these murals as a public expression of indigenous transcolonial priority in Mestizaje desde abajo. This panel, once again, is citing the mixture of Mesoamerican and Chicanex motifs with the traditional traje pants, the huaraches and the machete on one hand, and the teardrop spider and dollar tattoos on the other. 
this young Zapotecan is getting La Pinta, La Nina, and La Santa Maria tattooed on his chest with cloud shaped with cloud shaped like dialogue boxes you would find on uh, Mesoamerican codexes, suggesting that even this act of colonial embodiment of wearing colonial history on the skin is mediated by indigenous authorial voice, and that these murals are contemporary codex resignifying the past, making this history of colonial coercion of church and state, which we see here, uh, hiding the son of indigenous knowledge formation his own. The Zapotec traveler tucks his colonial history under his arm as he creates the, this hybrid geography, geography of Tracolu LA, insisting indigenous migrants never forget the priority of their transcolonial belonging. It is we, the viewers, who must remember this world, the American continent, has always been theirs and not ours. The Tracolu Locos used what Jennifer Ponce de Leon has theorized as extradisciplinary aesthetics. They combine various genres with disciplinary knowledge to produce um, art that challenges the boundaries of both. The Takolu Ocos not only blend the visual with the literary, literary as a panoply of Zapotec, Spanish, and English phrases punctuate and supplement the images, they also incorporate and decolonize historiography, revising the Colombian saga from an indigenous, from an indigenous perspective. Similarly, in this detail, they meld the distinctive Day of the Dead aesthetics on the young girl's arm, itself emblematic of indigenous cosmology, with the uh, philosophical and political disciplinary knowledge upon which she sits. Vasconcelos, Vasconcelos Raza Cosmica has been resignified as Mestizaje desde abajo with the help of Foucault, whose understanding of biopower Zapotecs have thoroughly incorporated as easily as they incorporated Western musical instruments. Meanwhile, Zapotec political economy of communalism, Guendaliza, borrows from and completes Buchanan's unfinished treaty, Dios y el Estado, on anarchy. The Tracolo Locos inscribed their mural with extradisciplinary knowledge to disrupt modernist distinctions between aesthetics, philosophy, and history, because for indigenous cosmovisions, such divisions are not only non-existent, they threaten life on a planetary scale. To decolonize our Latin, Latinx knowledge production, we need to get extradisciplinary. The tools of textual or visual analysis alone cannot analyze indigenous cultural production. Analyzing these murals requires linguistic expertise and willingness to read across Zapotec, English, and Spanish language systems. It requires ethnohistory, anthropology, and sociology to properly understand the millennial history of overlapping indigenous geographies and employment and movement of pre-colonial belonging, as well as to comprehend the human-made causes of contemporary displacement. We, when will we stop calling the last three decades of indigenous movement from south to north a crisis and recognize it is a hemispheric remapping of the American continent by indigenous pueblos as the means of survivance and transcolonial um, belonging. Decolonizing knowledge production doesn't just require interdisciplinary method, however, because indigenous knowledge systems are extradisciplinary. Their philosophies, aesthetics, and science exist outside of Western systems and categories for knowing, even as they hide in plain sight behind the mask of mestizaje. Indigenous bioengineering, for example, challenges the very division between science and religion upon which Western epistemes are founded. Thus, a Latinx methodology for decolonizing Western knowledge systems includes the method of letting go and power, must letting go of power. It must include, we must let go as Latinx scholars of the subject presumed to know. Now I had another page, but I'm looking at the clock behind me, so I'm gonna stop. So we have a little time for, um, question and answers. It's a good thing I have this clock behind me. Thank you so much. What an extraordinary talk. You have given us so much. I'm just looking at my notes here and it's about how Mestizaje works to segment the labor force in, in the USA about the assimilation of in, indigenous immigrants. But what I was mostly struck by was that percentage that you told us, the 86.5% increase in indigenous population in the United States, meaning that the majority of those 
are, as, as you're um, uh, uh, supposing, from Latin America, predominantly from Mexico and Central America. And my question, my first question stems from that percentage. Um, I, it's so, so elegantly how you talked about these movable racial geographies and how they, uh, how these identities just come into being with this much larger historical baggage that's coming that you so beautifully traced with the Gelaguetza and the Wendalisa, which I did not know. So thank you so much for that. So my question is, how do these uh, racial geographies or these identities overlap or onto existing indigenous groups already in the United States? You, you give us this, this really beautiful example of the um, racial identities and geographies and the tensions that exist between the Mixtec and Zapotec, but what about existing indigenous communities and how are they in dialogue with this, this new, um, these identities? Well, I think there's a rift between the way in which uh, indigenous communities assist and welcome indigenous immigrants and the way in which, uh, you know, the knowledge production system of Native American indigenous studies uh, views these, this immigrant migration. So we see on the ground uh, along the, you know, U.S.-Mexico border, uh, the, the many uh, many indigenous <clears throat> peoples who live along the border uh, fighting, combating the government in subtle ways to allow for this continued migration. You know, the Navajo have a whole program on the ground of, of greeting and assisting um, these indigenous peoples. And I think that, you know, the, the, the first place I found the figures for the U.S. Um, census of 2020 was on the, you know, on the Indian country, the a Native American website. So on the ground, I think there's a claiming of these indigenous people, uh, a, a, a welcoming, but there's a, a miscommunication a or a, a lack of fit between the way in which, and I think it's really just the, the rise of the settler colonial paradigm. <clears throat> having been such an important part of the last, you know, 20 years in Native American Indigenous studies, and increasingly in Latinx studies, right, that has caused for this misconnect, right, because in, from their, from that perspective, these Indigenous immigrants are our avants. They're, they're coerced into migration, but they're nevertheless settling on somebody else's land, whereas I think, you know, what the murals show us is a, his, a deep history of migration that precedes the coming of Columbus, right? Um, and that was in the last side, reading the poem that goes alongside the murals. But, but so there's, there's indigenous, modes of indigenous recognition will have to be, in, in my view, if I were president, you know, this would lead to reevaluation of indigenous modes of, of identification by both the U.S. and the Mexican and the Guatemalan and the Andean governments, right? Because in Mexico, they just ceased this in their own census, but previously, in order to claim indigenous identity, you had to be fluent in your indigenous language, or at least claim to be. Right. So these kinds of things as, as, as kids move to the United States and yet their parents maintain, you know, these transnational ties, which are much easier now with social media being what it is, you know, there Mexico's going to have to loosen those identifications. And also for the kinds of benefits that affirmative action can give indigenous immigrants, that's what, you know, that's principally what I'm thinking about. Like, how do we get, you know, money to these people? It's about recognizing indigenous people as having a transcolonial, transcontinental belonging that must be recognized. Now that's a much bigger lift, as you know, with our, with our government. That's such a complete um, response and it touches into some of the questions. I have so many other questions, but I see that the audience does too. So I will speak to you later so we can get to some of the questions here. Um, uh, this one, you touched a little bit on it in your response, but this is about education and children when it, um, of indigenous uh, parents. And the question is, do you have an insight on what the needs are for children of these communities, particularly in educational spaces, followed by how is academia, or at least your institution, making way for indigenous community members and their children to be there to be able to speak about these issues? In thinking about decolonizing epistemologies, I think part of that is also about bringing their own personal perspectives. I 100% agree. I 100% agree. In a city like New York, 
right? Where 25% of the population is always foreign born. You know, census after census, you can go back many years. They already have Mishtek as part of their bilingual uh, educational program within, um, you know, the areas in which there's a predominancy of, of Zapotec people. I mean, I'm sorry, Mishtek people. So this is, this should be generalized, but we have, you know, we, again, the differentiation between rural and urban spaces, we know the history of bilingual education. Can you imagine like trying to pass bills, even though the US in the 1920s had a multilingual educational system in the Midwest, for example, teaching all different kinds, teaching in all kinds of European languages, you know, the lift now to take, you know, to take indigenous languages seriously. One of the things that I'm working on in Coalición Mexicana, I'm trying to get the funds for, is creating a Saturday Sunday school where, you know, we teach, like they teach Hebrew or Korean or Chinese, you know, or Mandarin and Cantonese, you know, teaching various indigenous or at least the indigenous languages that are relevant to the populations that we serve as, as we can, you know, as much as we can. Um, you know, I, I argue on the basis of letting in indigenous uh, immigrants from, 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 from other parts of the Americas when I'm on admissions, but that's what I'm saying. We can't rely on admissions a dis, you know, uh, people who happen to be sympathetic to be in admissions committees. We all know how that works. What we need, I think, is a policy of saying, for the purposes of admissions, indigenous peoples, be there be, from wherever they are, uh, you know, should be considered Native American and minority, right? I think that unofficially, you know, all sorts of admissions committees across the country are doing this. I think UCLA has, has graduated a number of Zapotec PhDs, right? So there must be some, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I'm not at UCLA, I don't, but you know, the number of them makes me assume that they have some kind of program in place for, or some kind of recognition that's happening. But we need a more broad-based uh, approach, I think. And, and, you know, I think that Title VI funds are so important, but of course, only a select group of universities have them, right? For heritage speaking, right? For, for Mishtek, Zapotec, Triki, Purepche, we need to have heritage speaking classes, you know, available in our universities. We happen to have a consortium where, in, in, in New York City, of Columbia, CUNY, and, and, and NYU, where we teach Nahuatl, Mishtek, and Quechua. But again, it's like, once again, we're in New York City. It's a, I'm sure you could do it in, you know, in Boston and, you know what I mean, in Cambridge, you know, but what about those other places in the country? It's a, it's a pressing issue. And yes, we need to get indigenous peoples from Latin America speaking, you know, getting doctorates, you know, being on admissions committees, you know, that's, that's to me the next, the last 10 years of my career are going to be dedicated to that. That's a wonderful goal and a wonderful aim. Um, uh, I'm trying to get to as many of these questions as possible. One from Americo Mendoza Mori, uh, who uh, commends you on this wonderful talk. And he asks, do you consider that proposing Mestizaje desde abajo aims to expand the US context of Latinidad from within rather than working proposing for positionalities outside of Latinidad? Oh, that's a great question. I think it has to be both. You, I, that would be my, my uh, uh, for, you know, it, it, there's, there's work to be done on either side. I, you know, I, sometimes I think, why am I even revisiting mestizaje? Let's just get rid of that term. But mestizaje, as you know, uh, as well, I have a graduate student, Emmy Sawada, who's working on this mestizaje, uh, so many people claim it still, you know, if it were up to all the intellectuals, you know, Mexico started critiquing the term in the 60s and 70s, you know, we've been critiquing it in Chicano studies for 20 years, but people continue to identify with it. And I think this is part of the reason why is because at least, at least Mestizaje gave, um, as Emi Suarez says, uh, uh, Chicanos who had lost indigenous ha ha uh, indigenous identities, a genre of being, recognizing themselves. And the question is, why is it only in Chicanx and Latinx uh, communities that we recognize mestizaje when the, all of the United States is mestizo, right? So what kind of uh, space does mestizaje de abajo, but I'm not in the business of saving mestizaje as a term, but I am curious what kind of space it can help provide. Like it is a tool, but we also need paradigms that are coming from the outside. I completely agree. Um, the next question, I'm going to put two of them together. So there's one um, from Margarita Wagua. Could you please elaborate on linguistic mestizaje? 
and the other one from Pamela Yates. What possibilities do you see for indigenous solidarity south and north, regardless of borders? Or is the solidarity impossible because of the broad diversity of Native American and Mesoamerican pueblos indígenas? Would you repeat the first question? Yes. Could you please elaborate on the oh, on like the this this second? Um, well, I I, I think um, anybody who's ever you know traveled <laughs> across the Americas, you know, suddenly you're in a, you're in the Andes, and I'm like, do I speak the same language? <laughs> I don't I don't even understand the street signs, and I can't order, and you know what I mean. And that's when I you notice, oh, oh, you know, Spanish isn't Spanish. In the Americas, it's you know, it's it's not the Spanish of Spain, right? Because I remember when I when I went on my PhD journey, my mother gifted me this 19th century dictionary of Mexican Spanish because that I so I could look up all those words, right? That 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 don't exist in the Real Española Academia, you know, because Spanish has so colonized. I mean, the uh, indigenous languages have colonized Spanish. That's what I mean, that there's a linguistic mestizaje that we, that implies a conceptual mestizaje, right? Because as we know, language is an expression of culture. It's an express, all of the language has meaning only within a system. So that linguistic mestizaje means that we have shifted our culture, you know, our cult, but there's no such, you know, and you spend 10 minutes in Spain and you're like, oh my God, there's son barbaros, por Dios, no saben, no saben controlar sus emociones, you know what I mean? Like the way the differences in being are, are registered in the language. So that, that's what I mean. In terms of a Pan American solidarity, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like that's not for me to say as I'm not an indigenous person, but it's how, I mean, I think that's what 1992 was. It was an expression of, you know, trans American pan indigenous um, solidarity. Indigenous communities don't have to agree on modes of, 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 of governmentality. They have to agree on a political program around X factors, right? So that, and I think that, you know, the US has a lot that it could learn from Latin America <laughs> in terms of how indigenous peoples have position themselves in such a way that, you know, in the rewriting of the Chilean constitution, 30% of the people rewriting that constitution are indigenous. You know, I mean, that, they, that the history of indigenous uh, intervention, participation, initiation of history in Latin America has something to teach us. We have to unlearn our presumption that it's mestizo, you know, supremacy that's led this, right? And at the same time, learn from the strategies of organizing and the strategies of being that indigenous people have, you know, used to in insist on their, you know, on their, on their, on their right to be here. I think we can squeeze one more question because we, we have so many in the chat, but someone wants to know what is Profe Maria's next project? Very excited to hear someone talking about the need to the need to acknowledge the gatekeeping nature of Chicano X studies. Oh, I know, I know. Well, um, you know, the my 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 uh, I have one of my writing projects is is to continue to revisit the concept of mestizaje through things that that spark it in me. In other words, I'm not going out there looking, but you know, I saw these murals and I was like this is mestizaje to the other level, right? Because there's no reference to Anglo culture. Well, there's the Coca-Colas, you know what I mean? But the mestizaje that's happening between Chicanx aesthetics and Zapotec aesthetics is so fabulous, right? Like it, it just like blew my mind. So I wanted to write about the murals and then the census figures came out. And, you know, so I'm just revisiting mestizaje to see if it has any juice we can squeeze out of it or if we can rework it in a series of essays. The other project is uh, completely disciplinary uh, just because I'm, I'm, I don't wanna do another big research book. So I'm writing on indigenous and Latinx speculative film and fiction. That's my next monograph project. What a terrific way to end. Um, we're making this, these short lunchtime talks but you have given us a full feast, a real buffet of ideas that we're gonna take with us Thank you so much for such a Thank rich you. talk. Thank you, Gabriela. And um, I want to, before we, we give a final uh, thank you to our guests, to remind everyone that our next talk is Wednesday, April 13th. It's Violence and Death in Contemporary Mexico, Meanings, Mobilizations, and Justice from Below with Will Pansters and Claudio Lomnitz. 
uh, moderated by my colleague Diane Davis. So please join me in thanking once again uh, Professor Saldaña Portillo for her extraordinary talk that has given us so much to move forward and to think through. Thank Thanks. you so much for being with us today.